Good morning. Welcome to Grace United Methodist Church. We are so glad that you have chosen today to gather with us in worship this morning. Before we begin our time of worship, just a few announcements. We are working on some special worship events that we need your help with. We would like for you to send us a photograph of yourself with your mother or with your grandmother uh, or with a special person in your life who has been like a mother. Um, and so we'd like for you to scan those and send them to us or email them to us um, at can the Candace Dunning at gmail.com. We're going to work on a special thing to use them in worship for Mother's Day on May the 10th. Um, so we need them by um, Monday, May the 5th encourage you to do that, to send them to us so we can um, gather together and enjoy um, a special event for Mother's Day. Also, parents of high school graduating seniors, uh, you should receive an email from us this week with details about what we need for you to do uh, in order that we could honor our graduating seniors. We're going to be working on some special things for them for May the 24th. If you don't receive that email, please contact us and let us know and we'll try to get it resent to you. Also, our newsletter goes out every Monday, which includes a prayer list, a link to our sermon if you missed the message this week, uh, as well as other important information. Um, if you're not receiving that email um, with our newsletter, be sure to go on our website and you can sign up there to receive our e-newsletter. Also want to remind our children, they'll, they'll have story time with Miss Jody Wednesdays at 1 o'clock. Our youth will meet 5 o'clock um, on Sunday evenings with Miss Doreen on Facebook. Um, encourage you to sign on and to continue to be a part of those special groups. We are so glad you're with us this morning. Let's enter into a time of worship together. Please join me in the call to worship. Our God. You created the world and called it good. You created man and woman in your image and called them very good. But we have been deceived by half-truths and false promises. We have tasted temptation and it is bitter in our mouths. We thought our desire for forbidden fruit would bring us wisdom, but it brought us heartache. Please cover us in your love, take away our sin, restore our relationship with you, O oh God. Thank you for joining me for Children's Time. My name is Miss Jody, and today we're going to talk about Adam and Eve. Last week we talked about creation and how God created the world in seven days. Isn't that amazing? Seven days. 
he created Adam and Eve during these seven days. And he told Adam and Eve, you have you have free range of the land. You take care of the animals and the plants. You can eat whatever you want. You just can't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Well, a snake came along and told them, hey, that might be a good idea. Those apples are good, right? So Adam and Eve decided to do it. They didn't listen to God and they listened to the snake. So that created the first sin. So to represent sin today, I brought this. <gasps> chocolate syrup. Who doesn't love chocolate syrup? Well, chocolate syrup is pretty cool, but when you use it to represent sin, it's kind of messy. When I put it in my hand, it's sticky. It's kind of gross. It's leaking through my fingers. It's moving all over the place. This is what sin looks like, guys. It just creates a messy, sticky situation, and it leads to more sin. So what do we do? We don't want to sin. We don't want to lead to stickier, more situations. But you know what? The closer we are to God, the less we sin. So this is going to represent God and Jesus in helping us clear out this sin, getting rid of it. The closer we are to him, the less we have. Look at that. No more sin. So remember, the closer you are to God, the less you're able to sin. And that's great. That's great news. So make sure you're making good choices. Make sure you're making good decisions and thinking about God and what he would think and what he would say, okay? So say a prayer with me, all right? Dear God, thank you for keeping us away from sin. We love you and know you only want what's best. Amen. Amen, guys. I will see you next week. Bye. The church appreciates your continued financial support during this time. There are several ways you can give. We can, you can mail a check to the church. We are currently having our mail held at the post office, and we are checking it a couple times each week. You can go to our church website and click on the giving tab, and it will lead you through the process of giving electronically. You can also text do so by text by sending a message give to 254-781-3643 you will need to set up a profile the first time and then you can just text the amount that you want to give after that you can also give through a direct debit with your checking account to the church's checking account you can set this up through your bank the same way you might pay your bills through your bank account if you have any questions, please leave a message on the church's answering machine and someone will get back to you. Now, would you please join me in our offertory prayer? Gracious Lord, we believe in the amazing gift of your Son. We share this offering with the unceasing prayer that your work in this world will spring up and break forth in all corners of the global community. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Please join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended to heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
join me in prayer? Gracious God, we gather together virtually today to worship you. Indeed, you are worthy of our worship, our wonder, our amazement at all the works of your hands. Each day is crafted by you to bring new life into our lives and our world. Indeed, this is a new day and a new opportunity for living and breathing in the transforming power of your Holy Spirit. We welcome the Spirit in new ways among us today and ask that we would be receptive to its power and its calling in ways that we seek, in ways that may surprise us. In this time, we seek you in prayer to be conformed to your will and your love for us and all of creation. We hold in our hearts places of brokenness, relationships, promises, wills, spirits. We pray for those who suffer from internal brokenness, from mental or physical illness. May they find support in the community they need to flourish. May your healing touch be upon them. Eternal God, we confess that we have tried to hide from you when we have done wrong. We have lived for ourselves. We have turned from our neighbors. We have refused to bear the troubles of others. We have ignored the pain of the world. We have passed by the hungry, the poor, and the oppressed. O oh God, in your great mercy, forgive our sins. Free us from selfishness that we may choose your will and obey your commandments. Hear our prayer, holy God, and move us to be your faithful people. You are the source of everything we are. We seek your guidance in every part of our lives. Without you behind everything, every matter we attend to has so little meaning. Our work may seem like it is accomplishing much, but in the grand scheme of things, we do little when we do not move with the power of you, God, as our energy. Walk with us, God, in our joys and in our struggles. Help us to serve you devotedly, but ultimately to acknowledge you in the paths we walk toward faithfulness. We pray all these things in the name of the one who gives us strength, wisdom, and joy in the journey our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray as one people. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
comes out of the book of Genesis, the third chapter, verses 1 through 13. Let's prepare our hearts to hear from God's holy word. Gracious and holy God, we love you. We are so grateful for the profound word that you give to us in the scriptures. And so God, I pray this day that you would open that up for us. Help us to hear it with new ears. Open our hearts and our lives to receive what you have for us this day. And God, I pray, either through me or in spite of me, that you would speak your word to your people. We ask it in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen. But before coming to serve as the pastor here at Grace United Methodist Church, I served in another church, a Troy United Methodist Church, not too far from here. And while I was there, had the incredible opportunity to build a new church building. We were selling our old one to the Department of Transportation uh, for the widening of I-35. Now, it was a long and challenging process to buy land and to develop what the church would look like. It took several years to go through that process. It was so exciting when it was now finally time to move into our new church home. So one Sunday afternoon, we moved all of the things back into our new building and we began to settle in. Now we had six days to get everything put in its place because we had a wedding on that following Saturday and then our opening worship service on that following Sunday. I remember coming to church that Wednesday before all of that to work on all kinds of things to get ready for worship and I noticed there was a strange smell. Brand new building, very odd smell. It got worse as the day progressed. Uh, there were some other people there. I said, do you smell that? Yes, they smelled it. We began to hunt to try to discover where the smell was. Maybe someone had left some trash or, or there was something else. But the more we hunted, the more we began to know what that smell was. Um, this church was built in the middle of a, with fields all around it. And a little field mouse had decided to come into our building and it had died inside the wall of the church pantry. Yeah, you know that smell. Maybe you've uh, smelled it before. Now we have a choice here. Either rip out the nice, beautiful new sheetrock in the pantry uh, until we found the um, critter, or um, buy things to try to absorb the smell and wait it out. We chose option two. And by Saturday, it was much, much better. It wasn't completely gone, but it was tolerable. And by that following Sunday, everything was fine again. Now, as I think about that story, it really is a metaphor for our lives. We all have some stinky secrets hidden in the recesses of our lives. And God wants to come in and tear down the sheetrock and pull down the walls and reveal those places in our lives. And God wants to be about the healing of us. And that is the good news of the scriptures. We're in a series called Long Story Short, in which we have been trying to understand the big picture story of the Bible. George Barna um, is a pollster, and he asked Americans, how often do you read the Bible? 12% of Americans said they never read the Bible. 48% of Americans say they use it three times or less a year. And only 14% of Americans say they read the scriptures on a daily basis. Christians have to get serious about the reading of God's holy word. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, said that he was a man of one book, the Bible, and that we are called to be that same way. The scriptures are so important to the life of Christian believers. Last week, as we began our series, we talked about the first chapter. We talked about creation. 
We talked about how God at his very core is about love and about how all creation, the universe, the earth, you and me and everything else in all of creation was created as an expression of God's love. We talked about how we were created out of a relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and that we were created to live in relationship with God and with others. And so we ended last week with the picture of the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve there. The word that gets translated for Eden actually means delight. The Garden of Eden was a place of perfect love and delight. The picture of Adam and Eve, naked and unashamed in this idyllic garden. The picture of perfect relationships between each other. No walls, no fear, just perfect love of God and one another. The picture of how we were created to live. Now, since that picture of the garden is so great and the thought of God's love so awesome, a lot of us would just like to stay there. We would just as soon tell ourselves, um, God loves us and so nothing else matters. It really doesn't matter what I think or what I say or what I do because God will love me and God will forgive me no matter what. And we would just as soon pretend that there's no such thing as sin. But we'd be wrong. Sin is real. And that's what we read in chapter 3 of the book of Genesis. We read a story that many of us have heard before. The story of Adam and Eve and a snake and a tree and an apple. This is a story the ancient Israelites told one another to explain a universal human experience. Sin. Paul writes about it in the New Testament in his letter to the Romans, chapter 7, verse 15. Here's what he says. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. We know what we're supposed to do, but so often we don't do it. There is something within us that rebels against doing what we know we're supposed to do. There's something within us that says that God's rules aren't really there for me to live by. And let's face it, God gives us rules. Just like he told Adam and Eve they couldn't eat from the one tree, just like he tells the Israelites um, in the desert when he gives them the Ten Commandments, God gives us rules to live by. And some people look at those rules and they say, well, what's up with that? Is God some sort of great cosmic killjoy? Do you really need all those rules and regulations? Do you really need to put God first in every part of your life? Do you really need to take a regular day of rest, a Sabbath? I mean, if I do that, then I'll be less productive. Do we really need to treat everyone else, and I mean everyone else, just the way that I want to be treated? If we do that, then people could walk all over us. And maybe one way to answer those questions is to look at the world around us today. Our world is sort of a natural experiment of whether we really need all those God-given rules that, or not. Because in our world, we see what it looks like if we don't follow God's rules. Our world puts money and power and fame and so many other things before God. It never rests. It goes 24-7, encourages us to do the same. It treats people not as precious children of God who are to be loved and honored, but as things to be manipulated and thrown away. So how's that working for us? How's the world doing? Do we have peace? Do we have joy? Do we have hope? Do we have love? Are we living in God's garden? There is something that separates us from living in and living out God's love. And that thing is sin. And sin is real. And when you get right down to it, sin isn't really about following the rules anyway. I think that's where we get hung up. As you may have read, God loves us. God loves you. God wants what's best for us. And what's best for us, what we were created for, is to live in relationship with God and with other people. 
And the rules God has given us are aimed at facilitating those relationships, enabling and expanding that love. And as we begin to live in that love, God's rules cease to be rules at all. They're not things that are imposed on us from outside, but things um, that we just naturally do as we are more and more conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. God gives us those rules as a roadmap into a life lived in God's love and grace. So when we violate those rules, sure, we're sinning against God, but the person we're really hurting is ourselves. And we know it. We have experienced it. And while we don't allow our job, when we don't allow our jobs or our finances to rule us, and we put God first, we understand because we live a more fulfilled life. When we take time to rest and to recharge, we live a more fulfilled life. When we treat everyone as a beloved child of God, not as a thing to be used for our own purposes, we live a more fulfilled life. We know this. And yet we still wander off. We still sin. Instead of calling it the fall, I think more accurately we could call it falling because we are still doing it long after Adam and Eve started it all. And so we've got this story in chapter 3 of the book of Genesis showing us how sin works and showing us how it harms us and prevents us from living in God's love. It starts with an invitation to doubt God's authority. We're going to walk through the scripture together and see what we learn. So in Genesis chapter 3, listen for verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? So here we have the tempter, the serpent, the one the Bible will later call the devil or Satan. And as he questions the authority of God, did God really say? So we are tempted to question, did God really say that? Did God really mean? Who's the ultimate authority in my life, me or God? Sin tempts us to question God's authority in our lives. Rick Warren, the pastor at Saddleback Church, says the biggest problem in your life and in mine is us. That's why there's a great big I in the word sin. It's right in the middle of it. It's when I think I know more than God does. Next, sin invites us to question God's holiness. Genesis 3, 2 to 5. The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So Eve starts by setting the snake straight on what God really said. It's just the one tree we can't eat from. So then the serpent moves to his second tactic, questioning God's character and misrepresenting him. You won't die. In essence, the snake calls God a liar. The tempter is tempting Eve to think about God the same way she thinks about her neighbor down the street, who may occasionally embellish a story for effect, rather than thinking of him as the all-powerful, all-knowing creator of the cosmos, encouraging her to think, maybe God didn't really mean it. Maybe those rules God gave us are more like guidelines. The third thing 
Sin does is it distorts God's image in us. Genesis 3, 6 and 7. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. And then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. So Eve bought the tempster's lies about God's authority and God's holiness. The forbidden fruit that she didn't care about before now looked so good and delicious that she couldn't resist it. She eats. Adam eats. And now the man and the woman who were naked and felt no shame are now filled with shame at their nakedness. They were created in God's image, but that image is no longer good enough for them. When we go against God, there's always a little piece of us who knows it, and we are ashamed. Fourth, sin harms our innocence. The story goes on in verses 8 through 10. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Did you hear that important word that was in our scripture there? It appears twice. Hid. As the story continues, Adam and Eve, who were made by a good God, are now afraid of God. The intimacy between God and his finest creation has been damaged. A friend of mine says, intimacy can be defined as into me you see. It is being able to look inside of someone. It is about vulnerability, no shame, no fear, no guilt. Sin affects our intimacy. God has not changed one bit. Adam and Eve are the ones who have changed. Something deep within them now hides from the very one who made them, cares for them, and loves them. The innocence of their relationship is lost. Did you also notice it was God who initiated the contact with them? It was God who came looking for them. Adam and Eve, where are you? In this divine game of hide and seek, God came looking for them. God does not give up on his damaged creation then or now. Fifth, sin damages our other relationships. Verses 11 through 13. God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, and I ate. And then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent tricked me, and I ate. The blame game starts. God calls Adam and Eve out on their disobedience. Adam blames Eve. Eve blames the serpent. Adam even blames God. It's that woman you gave me that caused me to do it. The relationship between the first couple is strained. The relationship with God is damaged. How often do we do the same thing? Trying to deflect the blame from us. Sin just naturally diminishes our capacity to love others and to love God. It damages our relationships. And the final point about sin is that it has consequences. 
If we skip down a little bit and read Genesis chapter 3, verse 23, it says, Therefore the Lord God sent them forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which Adam was taken. Eden, the place of delight where they were created to enjoy and tend and protect, is lost because of their choice to disobey God. Those of us who are parents know that as painful as it may be, sometimes the best thing we can do is to let our children experience the consequences of their actions. And that's what God is doing here. Adam and Eve have chosen, and God is allowing them to have to deal with the consequences. But like a parent, God does not stop loving them. After all the harm they've done to their relationship with God and with one another, God does not abandon them. In fact, God covers them. In Genesis 3, 21, it says that the Lord God made garments of skins for the man and his wife and clothed them. God didn't abandon them. Despite their rebellion, God didn't stop loving them. Sin estranged to them from God and from one another and even from themselves. They disobeyed God and they bear the consequences. But God didn't give up on them. In the beginning, of the picture of God. it's the beginning of the picture of God's grace that God will cover over all of our sins with the blood of Christ. There's a story that Jesus tells in the New Testament. It's a story of a son who goes to his father, asks for his inheritance. The father gives it to him. The boy leaves. He spends it all. One day he wakes up in a pig pen and thinks to himself, "I should go home." Smelling of pig empty-pocketed, filled with shame. He thinks to himself, well, maybe my dad um, will give me a cot in the back room and a job as a slave. But instead, when he gets home, the father responds by calling for the finest robe to be put on him. Smelly, sin-filled, shame-filled, fear-filled. Put the robe on him. Cover him get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the fatted calf for we will feast today because the son of mine was lost but now has been found. This boy's filth was covered by his father's generosity and love. That, my friends, is called grace. We love the end of that story. And so often we forget what the son did before the father covered him. In the story, the son says, Father, I have sinned against you and God, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Do you know what the son was doing in that moment? He was acknowledging his own sinful nature. He was acknowledging his choice. He was acknowledging that sin is real and it hurts us. But it's not the end of the story. Even as God was clothing Adam and Eve before he sent them out of the garden, God was formulating a rescue plan, a way to bring Adam and Eve and all of us into the relationship we were created for. So I invite you to come back next week as we begin to hear the beginnings of God's great rescue plan through Israel. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you, Lord, for the way it confronts us. And this day, God, we are grateful and thankful for your grace and your mercy and your never-ending love. Thank you, God, that when we mess up, when we make mistakes, when we choose our own way, that you never stop loving us and that you have made a way for us in Christ. We thank you for that great gift. And it's in your son's holy name we pray. Amen.
Spirit be with us today, tomorrow, and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>